Section 5.2, critiquing one's tradition with the resources of one's culture. Okay, so self-criticism using the resources of one's own deep culture. But the only way to grow from within one's tradition is to engage in critique from within the assumptions of that same culture. It is necessary to find within one's own culture the originary moments of self-criticism. It is in this way that Al-Yabri carries out a deconstruction of his own tradition with critical elements of the same and with others adopted from modernity itself. So resources from within one's own culture and all, also resources from a Eurocentric perspective and you know, trying to use all the resources to do a deep self-criticism. Um, it is not modernity that imposes the tools upon the critical intellectual. It is the critical intellectual that controls and directs the selection of those modern instruments that will be useful for the critical reconstruction of her own tradition. In this way, Al-Yabri shows that the Eastern schools of the Arab world should initially confront head-on their primary enemy, Gnostic Persian thought. Okay, Gnostic Persian thought. And this is, um, this gets at, uh, when I was covering Arabic philosophy, how I, I was emphasizing uh, how Neoplatonic elements would, you know, kind of contradict and undermine the Aristotelian elements, and, and these things weren't kept entirely separate. Um, this Gnostic Persian thought is, uh, is very um, Neoplatonic. And Neoplatonism, you know, is a big part of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a big part of uh, early Christianity. Uh, so these, these things all kind of go hand in hand. And Christianity was highly influential upon Islam. So, um, so there's, you know, there's good reasons why Islamic philosophers begin to gravitate naturally to Neoplatonism, even though they want to be Aristotelian. Um, okay. So, uh, in this way, Al-Yabri shows that the Eastern schools of the Arab world should initially confront head-on their primary enemy, Gnostic Persian thought. In a strict sense, the Mutazilis uh, strictly created the first theoretical Islamic thought, which was anti-Persian, with components of the Quran, but which also creatively subsumed elements of Greek Byzantine culture with the political aim of justifying the legitimacy of the caliphate state. This is how Eastern traditions were born. However, the Abbasid schools in Baghdad, as well as in the outlying regions like Samarkand and Bukhara, as well as the Fatimite traditions of Cairo with theorists such as Al-Farabi and Avicenna, were inclined towards the Neoplatonic thought with theological mystic tinges like Enlightenment. Okay, and so this this is mystical enlightenment uh, uh, in this earlier phase. On the contrary, and against many historians of Arab philosophy, Al Yabri te teaches that the properly Western Andalus Maghreb philosophy in the West, in Northern Africa, and in the Iberian Peninsula situated around the great cultural capitals of Cordoba in the north and Fez in the south, represented an original rupture that would have a powerful and lasting legacy for motives as much political as economic. And here Moroccan philosophy utilizes the critical tools of modern European philosophy, the Cordoban Caliphate, which as we have seen was Western, broke the theology, theologizing perspective of Eastern thought, thereby inaugurating a clear distinction between natural region, which achieves knowledge through scientific observation, developing physics, mechanics, and the mathematics in a new way, and enlightened reason attained through faith. This introduced a distinction between reason and faith in which these were neither blurred together nor negated, but rather articulated in a novel way. And so uh, this is, you know, 
uh, natural philosophy versus revealed um, uh, theology, and um, and I went into uh, I went into um, uh, this at some length and repeated sort of sort of approaches in my discussion of Arabic philosophy and scholastic philosophy. Okay, so this is a running theme. Um, it was a philosopher, Ibn Abdun, who brought the rationalist ori orientation of the Baghdad school to an al-Andalus, uh, al contrary to the position of al-Kindi, al-Farabi, and Avicenna. A second generation at the beginning of the 5th century of the Hegira, the 11th Christian century, this is the 1000s, specialized in mathematics and medicine. The third generation with Avampas integrated physics and metaphysics and discarded the Neoplatonic Gnosticism of the Eastern School, invoking rational Aristotelian argumentation purged of Neoplatonism. The Almohads had the following cultural motto, abandon the argument from the authority and return to the sources. This was the cultural movement led by Ibn Tumart during times of great uh, change and thereby uh, of great political liberty and critical rationalist impetus. Ibn Tubar criticized analogy, seeing it as a method which moves from the known to the unknown. Al-Farabi and Avicenna had sought, due to the multiplicity of the political problems of, the e of Eastern sought, thought, to unite philosophy and theology to bring them together. Averroes in the Almohad West intended to separate them while showing their mutual autonomy and complementarity. So you can either try to fuse philosophy and theology, that's a Neoplatonic sort of way of doing things, or you can keep them separate uh, and let them operate independently but complement each other in certain ways, which is the more um, Aristotelian way of doing it like Averroes. Such was the theme of his work Doctrina Decisive e Fundamento de la Concordia entre la Revelation y la Ciencia, Decisive Treaties Determining the Connection Between the Law and Wisdom. Okay, a veritable discourse on method. And remember, discourse on method, on the method, is Descartes' seminal work of 1637. So this uh, work of Averroes um, is a, a veritable discourse on method. Revealed truth cannot contradict rational truth. Truth cannot contradict truth and vice versa. In particular, his deconstruction de la destruction, the incoherence of the incoherence, shows that the arguments with which Al-Ghazili sought to demonstrate the irrationality of philosophy were not demonstrably true or apodictic, um, uh, logically, you know, solid. Thus, Averroes elaborated and expressed the so-called doctrine of double truth, so wrongly interpreted in the medieval Latin world. At the same time, the Cordoban philosopher suggested a method through which to interact with other cultures. Oh, that's interesting. So now he's showing how much of what we think of as scholastic reasoning and the evolution of scholasticism in Europe is actually rooted in the work of Averroes and even what we think of as like Descartes' scientific methodology uh, is rooted in Averroes pushing modernity back further into the past. And Averroes then also has this interesting uh, method through which to interact with other cultures. So uh, Dussel is uncovering through al Yabri this multicultural dialogue, intercultural method of dialogue that goes all the way back to Averroes. And this is exactly Dussel's, one of Dussel's main projects is how do we develop a legitimate, authentic intercultural dialogue. Uh, it is doubtless that we need to make use to aid our research, uh, a rational study of existent beings of the investigations carried out by all those who precede us. In other words, the Greeks, et cetera, et cetera, 
Uh, be that it is, and since in reality the ancient philosophers already studied, and with greater care, the rules of reasoning, logic, method, it would be useful for us to lay our hands on the books of those philosophers, so that if we find everything they say therein to be reasonable, we accept it. But if there is something unreasonable, it can serve as a precaution and a warning. Okay, seems very reasonable. For this reason, to adopt the Averroes spirit is to break with the Gnostic, Obscurantist, and Eastern spirit of Avicenna. As we can see, Arab philosophy practiced this method that we are describing. It remained faithful to its tradition, but it subsumed the best elements of the old other culture, as determined according to its own criteria which were in some aspects more highly developed, for example, in elaboration of logical science. Okay, and of course Aristotle's logic is, is one of uh, Aristotle's grandest achievements. Um, <clears throat> so we start, so Dussel is using this uh, Arab philosophy as an example of what he sees as a good model for evolving one's own cultural perspective. Start from your own culture. Delve into the deep uh, 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 roots, spiritual, mythical roots of that, um, of that culture, but self-criticizing it, but self-criticize it on its own terms, but also incorporating useful elements from other cultures. Okay, this is a great uh, method of, of of self-criticism. And notice that it is about self-criticism. And, and, and this is something that that many people overlook uh, when we start to talk about intercultural dialogue or um, uh, or uh, uh, affirming one's own culture. Uh, a properly philosophical approach to this is always to be self-critical because it's through self-criticism that one evolves and that one remains relevant, not only to others, but also to yourself. And, and this is true about philosophy in general and about human beings in general. If you're not being self-critical, you're not growing. If you're not being self-critical, you are not growing. And, and of course, in your, in your essay, your final essay, I would like to see you be self-critical. That's the magic. Okay, in the same way, Rigoberto Minchu from Guatemala searches for the cause for the passivity and fatalism of related indigenous communities and initiates a, commun a community critique that will bring them to commit themselves to the struggle against the mestizo government and military repression. Thus, the critical intellectual should be someone located between, in betweenness, the two cultures, their own culture and modern culture, their own culture in the exteriority and modern culture at the core of the empire. This is really the issue of the border, the frontier between two cultures as a locus for critical thought. This theme is explored at length by Walter Bignogolo in the case of the Mexican-American frontier as a creative bicultural space. So the border, the southern border of the United States, northern border of Mexico, uh, that's where you know, two cultures come together in, in weird ways, very interesting. Okay, um, and, and so this, this border region is very important, so I just want to emphasize this by going back to this diagram too. Uh, you know, the Amer Amer Indian Latin American culture is on the border with North American hegemonic core culture uh, on the world, within the world system. And it's this border region where the self-critical uh, person from an exterior culture can best leverage the resources of both cultures is by standing on that border and drawing from both cultures. 
uh, and, and it is this exterior element that is the secret sauce though for someone with embedded within their own exterior culture they can see things in a different way that's just invisible to those within the hegemonic culture and as i've em emphasized you know liberal bourgeois thinking um, often is just a kind of uh, unconscious uh, sort of existence you just don't see things and so uh, this exterior the, the value uh, of these exterior uh, self-criticisms uh, doesn't just redound to those exterior cultures themselves, like Dussel, uh, but when we think about that self-criticism and what comes out of it and the unique features of it, we, from the center, can see new things that we didn't see before. And so that exterior uh, culture is not only transformative uh, for the exterior culture itself, but it's also transformative in our own self-criticism, which we have to do in order to grow, because we are moving forward. History does not stand still. History does not go backwards. All right. <clears throat> okay. That is good for that.